Today we're going to talk about a little video game that I don't think too many of you have ever heard of and it kind of took people by surprise in 2023. I didn't get around to it because, you know, there were so many other important things that were happening, so many more important games that came out. And I finally got the chance to finish this game recently and it is Baldur's Gate 3, baby. So today we're gonna to talk about Baldur's Gate 3, my experience with it. Playing it on the PlayStation 5, as opposed to playing it on the PC, is that the best way to play it? And my overall thoughts on, should you find the time to play this behemoth of an RPG? Now, to be perfectly clear, Baldur's Gate 3 was regarded as the best game of 2023. It was pretty roundly believed. In fact, it got to the point where I just kind of took it for granted that it was, even though I hadn't played it. I finally got to play it, I finally got to finish it. I put maybe 120 hours or something into my playthrough. And yeah, I mean, it's definitely the best game from 2023. It's definitely one of the best games of the last several years. I would put it right up there with Elden Ring, to be perfectly honest with you, with one of my favorite games of the past several years. Now, is it my favorite? Uh, probably not, mostly just because not my favorite kind of genre of game. The gameplay itself is not my usual cup of tea, so to speak, but the story, the characters, the world of Baldur's Gate 3, the experiences, I mean, the way that the game reacts to what you do, keeps track of what you do, and has others react over the course of the game is honestly incredible. And I can totally see why developers were threatened by the existence of Baldur's Gate 3. Why they said that players should not expect all games to be held up to the same high standard as Baldur's Gate 3. Now, I don't think that any reasonable consumer would say that every game has to be Baldur's Gate 3 now, or live up to that standard, or have that level of detail. Obviously, that's not the case, and the people that were saying that, I don't even know why you bothered saying it, but, I can see why they had the trepidation, why they had the fear of the game. It is mind bending to think about the level of detail, the level of choice that Baldur's Gate 3 gives to the player. And not only that, the ripple effect that is present in the game between your actions and how that cascades out and affects other events in the game, other areas in the game, other characters in the game, some you've met, some you haven't met, it affects your party, your how your party looks at what you've done. I mean, it's enough. honestly incredible what they've done here. And on top of that, they've created some of the best characters in the history of gaming. I mean, you've got characters like Lazelle, who is ruthless and aggressive and bred for battle. And she so strongly believes in her people and doing everything for her queen and Sometimes that leads her to attack your allies and maybe try to kill them. Can you feel it crawling through you? Tendrils squirming in your chest, gripping your heart. In the middle of the night or try to kill you because she, you know, worried that you're going to turn into a mind player. But she is fiercely loyal and she can be fiercely loyal to you as you play through the game. You have Shadowheart who has this dark past that she kind of doesn't remember and she's not really sure exactly why she's doing what she's Don't doing, but she's doing it out of blind faith for her need. lady Char. We should keep going. And at the same time, she seems, not just because of how she looks, but one of the most human characters that are in the game, even though she's a half-elf. You have Will, who is this warlock who has made a pact with the devil, or a devil, I should say. And suffer its sting. And he did it to protect his father and his people. But how that plays out over the course of the story, how the devil holds that contract over Will's head, and your decisions on how to approach that situation. You have Gale, who is this wizard who's Hello. kind of like a I'm wizard Gale, Casanova kind of guy who oh, courted geez. this magical it's god and then just kind of decided that it wasn't for him and he's he's trying to get power but he's so endearing at the same time 
He seems like a very likable guy, although he could do some very unlikable things at times. You have Asterion, who seemingly always has some kind of a side motive beyond the fact that he has some, you know, needs, we shall say, because of his condition and his past. You have some truly incredible characters, none the least of which is Karlak, who is a tiefling who has had her heart removed because while she was in hell, she was given over to this devil who ended up putting this engine in her that heats up and makes her incredibly strong in battle, but at the same time, it threatens her life as long as she's outside of hell. Now that we're old pals, how would you feel about helping me kill some evil bastards? These characters are truly incredible. They are truly fleshed out and they are truly memorable. Uh, Beyond that, the characters that you meet over the course of the story are incredibly memorable too. But player choice and characters are two of the greatest strengths of Baldur's Gate 3. Now, on top of that, they have created a truly immersive world. And because player choice and the depth of the characters is so amazing, the world itself reflects that, meaning that as you go through the game, as you make decisions, as you're working with your allies, who is with you at the time affects how things progress. You may have a particular area where if you have a certain character with you, then you'll have certain experiences. Or if you don't have that character with you, they may ask you about that character because they have some kind of a side motive and they're trying to find that character or hunt that character. Pity. Then again, Perhaps word of your agonizing death will draw your little friend to me. So is, there is this constant building of the story that's happening that doesn't feel like it's pulled apart and separated completely separate from general. anything else that's happened. Everything feels like hunt? one cohesive whole. Not that there are things that don't happen that are on the side and don't have a lot of impact, but everything kind of comes together and has an importance and has an effect. Now, to be brutally honest with you, it took me a little while to get into Baldur's Gate 3, probably because I don't have a lot of experience with tabletop RPGs or CRPGs, and because there is such an openness to the game that you can frequently find yourself kind of getting lost or wondering if the current quest you're working on is actually important to the story, how to really progress it properly. It's kind of designed for you to get lost in it. And it took me a while to kind of get comfortable with that so that I didn't feel like I was just treading water and not getting anywhere. But when Baldur's Gate 3 clicks, it clicks hard because all of a sudden you start to realize not the most sophisticated way of getting what you want from someone, is it? What kind of control you have over the story, where the narrative can go based off of what you want to do, what decisions you want to make. Do you want to be helpful and friendly to people? Do you want to be ruthless and cunning? Do you want to be deceptive? Do you want to be backstabbing people? Whatever approach that you want to take to the game, you have control of molding the story of the game. And that is such a novel idea in the space of gaming. There are usually very narrow opportunities for the player to have minor impacts on the way that a story plays out. But not so in Baldur's Gate 3. The whole thing practically, other than having to do a few specific tasks in any way that you feel like doing them, and the act structure. Other than those two things, everything else is kind of out there for your pleasure, if you will. Thinking about my playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3, there are a few things that really stand out to me. I will do my best to avoid spoilers, but there may be some minor spoilers, just for me to illustrate my points. A couple of the things that really differentiate Baldur's Gate 3 and the story of my playthrough and make it so memorable to me are, first and foremost, Karlak. She is an absolutely incredible character. She has a tortured past where her literal heart was taken from her and replaced with this thing that makes her stronger and makes her more powerful and more deadly. But at the same time, it means that she can't be close to people. And it means that time that she spends outside of the hells can threaten her life because this thing could Just overheat and live. kill her. Please. You would think that this oh, seven foot this tall, red skinned, horned monster would be a truly evil creature, 
but she couldn't be any more human if you actually made her a human. Believe me, these sneaky fucks won't stop till they have me hogtied at her feet. Because of the plights of her past, because of her love of her home city of Baldur's Gate, because of everything that she has lost and missed out on, she is a truly wholesome character. Add to that the fact that she swears like a sailor more than any other character in the game, and she's never afraid of getting into a fight. She's seemingly fearless. Karlak is just an incredible character. And again, without getting into spoilers, she's sort of the tragic hero of Baldur's Gate 3 because she does not want to go back to the Hells more than anything else. She would rather die than go back to the Hells. But because of this thing that has replaced her heart, she is doing anything she can to find a way to get it replaced, but she would rather die than go back. She has some truly visceral responses to specific characters. She gets revenge at one point on a specific character and she has this hollow feel to her like even though she accomplished what she set out to do it's not making her feel any better about her situation even if she's able to get what she wants she may not be able to save herself so i could rot because the person i trusted the most gave me away to the devil or experience some kind of sense of revenge or gratification at completing her task and it kind of dispels that storybook myth of getting revenge on the person who wronged you and how that can make you feel better and accomplishment it's almost shakespearean in a way she's not the only character that has an arc that's kind of similar to that i mean asterion has a pretty incredible arc towards the end of the game as well shadowheart has some really critical decisions to make as she progresses in the game, if you follow her story, I mean, every single character has these incredible storylines that can go one of many different ways. And the fact that you have the ability to do that and the fact that these characters are so endearing makes you want to play all of this side content. Sure, you could beeline as much of it as you wanted to. You could probably get through Baldur's Gate much faster. And I'm not talking about speed run. I mean like a full main story playthrough in maybe 50 hours or something like that if you're not focused on any of this side stuff. But you would be missing out on so much. And honestly, I dare you to try to do it because you're going to want to see what happens to these characters. You're going to want to help them and try to make their ending better. Honestly, that's a brilliant way to design your game. If you have the capability of bringing characters to this point where you know that the player will care about this character, I mean, what more of a motivating factor could you have for someone wanting to play side content. I think it's truly brilliant. Now, there's one more experience that I wanna talk about and it just illustrates what I'm trying to moment. say as far as how having these incredible characters leads you to all of these incredible inflection points over the course of the story. So one of the characters that you meet very early on, his name is Raphael and he is a devil my, my, and he wants to help you seemingly, but this. obviously, I mean, who a trusts the devil, right? Like, who is going to just be like, oh, yeah, sure. Come on, help me out. I, I don't have any worries about you doing something terrible and you having some kind of a side motive to helping me out. So you meet this guy, you instantly distrust him, especially if you have, like, Carlac with you as an example, and you try to kind of shoo him off, like... Yeah, yeah, uh, sure, whatever. We don't need your help, buddy. We'll make our way through it. But Raphael even says to you that you aren't desperate enough yet. But in your moment of desperation, you will come to me and I will be there to help you. And it's just this incredible inevitability, this incredible sense of this is the guy who's got some kind of foresight into the future and he's telling us that no matter what we do i stride among the needy giving comfort where i can and you're in dire need it's going to lead him back to him you know it's just like uh, thanos where he says i am inevitable well Raphael believes that he is inevitable as well and 
As you play through the story, he pops up in other places, and yes, your situation becomes more and more dire. You have fewer and fewer options, you find that certain things that you thought were going to work out don't work out as well, or you're still missing something, and you also get to a point where Raphael may have something that you need to continue the story. So my playthrough got to that point where Raphael had something that I needed, but I wasn't willing to sign over my soul to get it. What can you do in that instance? Well, why not break into his home in the hells and go and try to steal the item from him? It's this incredible experience where you have this looming thought of, God, we got to get this thing and get out of here before this guy shows up because he is going to be bad news in his own home. The place itself is pretty crazy. Uh, you find out a lot about Raphael's tastes, we'll say, and uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's pretty wild, to be honest with you. But ultimately, in my playthrough, I did not get out of there unscathed. And before I could leave with the item I came for, who comes popping back up? But Raphael to confront me and to say that he gave me my last chance, but this is over the line. I mean, he's the, the devil and he's, you know, taking people's souls and stuff. But what I did is over the line. You came here uninvited and you stole from me. In doing so, you brought the chaos of your world into mine. I will not abide. And he's here to make me pay. It's a, it's a pretty incredible situation. And on top of all that, you finally get into this battle. After a conversation, a couple of other characters pop up that you've met before. And depending on actions that you've taken, they may even take your side in the battle. But then the music kicks in. And I have never heard music like this in a battle. That was so perfect for the character of Raphael. I mean, it's it's just like, it's so unexpected. All of a sudden, the music that's playing is not just music that's specific to the scene, but it's actually the dude you're fighting that's singing part of the song. It's just incredible. You need to experience it for yourself. Highly recommend breaking into Raphael's house. All right, minor spoiler over. Look, at the end of the day, Baldur's Gate 3 is a huge investment, just like it was a huge investment to make, and it's a huge investment that other developers are scared of, but Larian Studios has made something incredible in Baldur's Gate 3. That all being said, I cannot recommend this game enough. If you can put the time in and play this game, you will never forget these characters, you will never forget some of these experiences, and Baldur's Gate 3 will find its way to the top of your favorites list without question. As for playing on PlayStation 5, would I recommend it? Well, if you're going to play like couch co-op, then it's a great way to play it. Uh, in general, it's a good way to play it, but you can tell that this game was really developed to play on a PC because you're going to get to the point where all of your little wheels and stuff, they end up looking more like um, action bars from a massive MMO or something like you're playing World of Warcraft and you've got all these skills to cycle through and it's much easier to just have a mouse and have things in certain areas and click on them I'm sure than using these wheels. That being said Larian Studios has done an amazing job with adapting this to the PS5. It does run well, it does work with this radial use with the R1, L1 and cycling through and all that, I can just tell that there's a bit of a clunkiness or cumbersomeness that would be better on a PC if you have the opportunity to play it that way or if you're already playing games that way. There are some technical issues with Baldur's Gate 3. There's a lot of texture pop in over the course of the game. I mean, I had one point where I had an NPC that looked like it tried to swallow a broomstick and instead it got caught in its cheek and it was just sticking out the side. In fact, it happened to two different characters. I don't know what that was about. There are situations where the lip syncing isn't quite as good or the motion cap is not quite as good. And also the pop-in happens even in cinematics. They're not like a pre-rendered thing, probably because they typically have your character in it or they have your party's characters and whatever changes have happened to them, their armor and stuff is reflected in there. It looks like your actual characters. It doesn't look like 
the base character or anything like that. Whatever the excuse is, there are issues with that. It does pop up. It is noticeable. It's not perfect in that regard. But all of the positives easily outweigh the negatives. And I can't possibly tell you how much I recommend Baldur's Gate 3. So let me know in the comments down below what you think of Baldur's Gate 3. And if you didn't get to play it last year, are you going to try to find the time to play it in 2024? That's going to do it for today. As always, I'm Pyrus for Pyrus Gaming saying thank you for watching. And until next time, I will see you there.